You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the BH app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Whites. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Today's topic, photo collage, and we're not talking about scrapbooking here. Joining us in the studio today are two visual artists who fuse photography and collage in non-conventional and often supersized manners. Jennifer Williams is a New York-based visual artist who originally hails from the fertile farmlands of western Pennsylvania. Her photo-based collages often depict urban architecture and cityscapes, but it's the arrangement and placement of these sometimes large-scale and site-specific works that distinguishes them. Whether they be urban neighborhoods, cardboard boxes, or step ladders, it's the collage work and blending of planes and points of view that are so engaging with her work. Jennifer has exhibited her work at the Akron Art Museum, Pittsburgh Center for the Arts, Queens Museum, and many other public art projects. She's also represented by the Robert Mann Gallery right here in New York City. Photographer and artist Tommy Mintz hails from the fertile avenues of Greenwich Village, New York City. Using a software program that he wrote in Python, Tommy creates automated digital collage images that present a randomly selected grouping of images in one chaotic, intriguing, often humorous frame. His work has been exhibited at the Hudson Guild Gallery, the Queens College of Arts Center, the Seligman Center, and he was an artist in residence at the Indie Grits Festival in Columbia, South Carolina. Welcome, Jennifer. Welcome, Tommy. We have a whole list of questions here, but I, I, the first question I want to ask uh, to both of you, you both are photographers or working in photography-based media. Did you start off taking what we call conventional single image photographs or did you pick up a camera and start working specifically with collage as your starting point and what you wanted to do? I'll let you guys fight out for who wants to go first. Um, I can go first. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, in, in the 80s, it, it was, you know, you got a camera, you took a picture, you made a print in a dark room. And it, it, the possibilities beyond that... Uh, weren't as easy, let's say, um, because of the work that went into making that photograph. You couldn't do it at home. You couldn't do it on a printer, like a digital printer, whatever. Um, but I will say, when I go back and I look at the images that I made in high school, it started there. I see myself taking photos in the way that I do now, like trying to, to get everything. Like that single frame wasn't enough. So it started there, and then when I got to college, it sort of grew, and then by, I guess, maybe the early 2000s, when digital started to come in, and you could print more not in a dark room, then, then it kind of it grew from there into what it is now. Were you but, ever doing, just like taking the scissors out and cutting up the photos that you took, and, oh yeah. and taking the 4 by 6s from the drugstore, and doing oh yeah. things with them, and chopping them up? And, yeah. 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 Absolutely. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Tommy? And yeah. I think I have the same history there with photography as a film and print medium that I cut up and glued onto board. Um, in the 90s, I got a computer and was scanning my film, scanning prints first before uh -huh. I was able to get a film scanner. I remember the first film scanner I got was a huge breakthrough, and I would develop my film and scan it. And that was a big deal. And, and then I was working in uh, Corel Photo Paint in the mid-90s and then Photoshop in the late 90s putting stuff together. And it was a real breakthrough in Photoshop. You know, it had layers and layer masks. And, and that made things that were previously either very difficult or I'd consider impossible mm -hmm. possible. Yeah. And so that was what sort of allowed me to really explore this collage that I feel, feel like Jennifer and I both had latent, you know, sort of like you're trying frustratingly with the single frame to get somewhere. I was working with um, long exposure multi-flash pictures in college where I'd go out at night and set up my camera on a tripod and then position myself in different places and pop the flash and, and um, have myself in multiple places on one frame of film. You know, it's like a multiple exposure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's so it sounds like the, the the frame was always problematic for you guys. You know, just trying to fit everything that you wanted to do within one frame, and you looking for ways to 
to break away from that or break out of that? Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Okay. I want that whole experience of being in a space or being going somewhere right. as opposed to it being like, I'm just showing you a portion of it, which mm. is what photography usually does. It, mm. it kind of curates that way and says, I want you to see this. Whereas I feel like I want you to see everything, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then you're still seeing it the way that I'm showing it to you. Right. So. And also in, in, in the case of your work, in some cases, you know, it's in a corner or it's over here, you know, so you're, this idea of everything has then been reduced and, and reshaped in, in different ways too, which I'm, is part of the evolution of the process, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Something I love about both of your work is that I'm a big proponent of cropping. I, I mean, mm. your, your camera has a certain aspect ratio and that's what it is, but it doesn't mean that's the shape of the actual photograph. And I find by cropping, the picture becomes more powerful quite often, okay? And I try to frame as tight as I can. Now, I know when I talk about cropping, there's some purists out there that go ballistic when they hear about that. You guys blow it all out of the water altogether because there is no aspect ratio for what you're doing. It's free form in many ways, some of your stuff anyway. So, you know, is that part of it too that you just wanted to break away from this constraint of what the camera says or was that not even part of your issue? Well, one of the things that I think I did early on as a game in high school was you take a, a, a roll of pictures, slightly panning on the first five, you tilt down a little bit, so you create a contact sheet, yes. sort of of a panoramic uh, sort of viewpoint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it maybe wasn't the frustration of the, the too much in the frame that I want to crop out, but yeah, I was looking past the frame. I, I, cropping, I, I don't really think of myself as a, a cropper, right? I mean, like, I, I want more rather than less, right? When I look at old photographs with the, the crop marks on them and the red line, the red, hmm. you know, paint mark, or wax yeah, pen. Wax pencil. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Grease pencil. Grease pencil, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I always want to see what's left out. Hmm. You know, I'm really interested in that gap that, that you know, the photographer, oh, no, you know. Um, there's some really famous pictures that I feel like are, are, are – um, Really interesting when you see the uncropped version. There's a picture of Ouija that Ouija took of um, some women at uh, the opening to the opera in the height mm -hmm. of the Great Depression. Oh, the, the heart stares. At the, uh, yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. Yes, okay. And, and he shot it wide. I mean, he was further away. And you look at the uncropped picture, and it has a very different sense mm -hmm. than sure. the intensity of this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in that space that's in the city. That's you know, you have these waves of crowds and, and empty space. And a lot of time, you crop out that empty space in a picture. But I'm interested in in in, in you know, in that space. Hmm. Interesting. And both your, are you guys okay with the definitions of collages? And I kind of want to preface that by saying your work, obviously there's a lot of randomness and, and things that you're not controlling that are coming in. And yours seems to be the opposite. It seems very like hyper controlled in the sense that you really want to make sure everything is in its right place to, to give you something that you're going to create. Do you, is collage okay with you? Is that what you call it? Is there a room for all of these opposites in within collage? It, it's funny because this is a discussion that comes up often, like mm -hmm. what is collage? Right. One of the questions is, is collage something that happens uh, as a found medium? So is it defined by the fact that they're not your photos? Mm -hmm. It's something that's found or it's it's text or, or whatever. Um, but the, if you're actually taking the images and they're your images and they're photographs, then um, is it still collage. Do you like, think that changes the definition, whether it's found imagery or stuff that you specifically captured rather than just... It's just, it's a conversation. Okay. Um, yeah. it didn't, for me, it didn't cross my mind. I mean, I right. That yeah. actually was one of my next questions. Is, do you take all the photos and is it necessary in, for your process that you have to yeah. start there? Yeah, yeah. It, it is. Um, there was one thing that I did years ago that someone asked me to do and I wasn't in the city and someone else took the photos and it was just impossible to... To, to make something out of it mm. because I wasn't there walking around looking at things, taking those pictures. Even if they looked exactly identical, it's like I wasn't having the experience yeah. of, mm. of, of going through the motions. Right. And because of that, I didn't have any connections to it. Right. So yeah, well, I, I think that's maybe, you know, with the found, ob the found imagery or the imagery that someone has taken, it's just sort of like where you as the artist is sort of placed within that. Yeah, I imagine if you're capturing your own, you have more control because you have one element and then when you're going for the next element, you know where it's going to be going because you have an idea. What it, yeah. Otherwise, you're, you're at the mercy of whatever anybody <laughs> else had seen and captured. Right, exactly. And do you start, yeah. like, does your process start with that walk around the neighborhood? Are you thinking as you're shooting and you're looking at angles of buildings, okay, this I can do this with later or do you just kind of reapproach it after you, you've done all the shooting? Um, no, I think it started starts as I'm walking around. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of like 
I, someone asked me to do something and I go visit the space. Right. That's the beginning of it. And so the journey of going there, walking to the gallery or, or, or room or, you know, whatever it is. And then like looking around as I go, I'm kind of pulling things out and trying to figure out like, what am I going to do with this? Mm-hmm. And, um, then it depends on how much time, like if it's here in New York, then I can go whenever I want and kind of look at it and do some research and go back. But if it's somewhere else, then I really have to to be present and, and take it in, go back to the studio, do a bunch of research. And then when I'm there shooting, like just shoot everything mm-hmm. as much as possible mm-hmm. and kind of bring it back. And um, then I'm like, okay, what, what do I have? What do I do with this? And when it's a, like a site specific place and let's say out of New York and different from the, the urban architecture, can you say to yourself what it is that you want to do with that space? Like how, how you want to reinterpret it with what you're going to take? Is that always kind of clear? I mean, it usually does, um, kind of start with somewhere that has undergone or is in the process of undergoing change. Mm. So it it does repeat itself kind of no matter where. I mean, I haven't done, uh, you know, a, a farm, but right. uh, there still might be something within that where it would still be like, this is what's happening right now. And, um, you know, what what is sort of changing everything around it. And this is these are the things that are there. And so it, it kind of like. You'd mentioned in those questions something about documentation. Mm-hmm. It is. It's documentation of a moment. And right. then that way it is photography, stopping time, mm-hmm. saying this is what's going on right now. And this is this is the, the case of this is sort of how everything is laid out and, and the, where it's going and where mm. it's been. Yeah, I had this idea that in some cases, especially with the urban stuff, it's this idea of taking what's outside and in, of course, reforming it and giving it everything. But, yeah, trying to... Yeah, bring what's outside in, you know, whether that's internally here or internally into a space, you know. So, yeah. 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 And Tommy, that kind of got gets a little bit to what I read of a quote of yours, which is, I'm interested in this rapid pace of construction, displacement, and efforts of preservation in the physical world mm-hmm. as well as in the digital world, right? Yeah, yeah. And I see that in Jennifer's work a lot, mm-hmm. you know, this idea of this rapidness of change that we're seeing, an explosion of building and 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 sort of forgetting of what was there before in a way that I yeah. think is um, very sort of uh, it hits an emotional note for me it's mm-hmm. very sad it's very poignant in a way too even if it's like you know wow celebratory look at all this shiny new stuff yeah. um, I, and I, I, I feel kind of saddened by all of it too and I feel like how do you express both those things. How do you show that? And Jennifer's work does that, I think, very effectively. I'm not sure if you feel that also, but I certainly get a sense of that poignancy of this moment of, you know, exuberant right. construction. Yeah. I mean, I, I hopefully that's that's a, a goal. So thank you. Um, <laughs> that, that it isn't, yeah, it's, it's, all of that is in there, even though, you know, it's not sort of spelled out on a, a plaque next to it, but that just, <laughs> just by looking at it, you can you so can much easier if that. it was, right? Just all written there for right, us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but that's the whole point. It's, it's a visual thing, and you're supposed to take away those those feelings about it right. from there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, the change, we, we're both, in, we're all in the city here, and, and this particular neighborhood has gone through mm. crazy change mm-hmm. uh, in the past few years with the High Line and all these explosions of, of construction in Hudson Yards. And one of the things that we've noticed around here is that the light has changed entirely. There are times, I, I still, I've been noticing now that all these zillion story buildings have shot up around us. There are now shadows across the streets and right in front of the building that were never there before. Mm-hmm. At the same time, there are also beams of light shooting around from all of these glass structures. Different times of day, there are cross beams of light. So it's changed and yeah, there's some old stuff that I missed that was wonderful, but there's some new dynamics mm-hmm. And it, it's 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 evolving. It's mm-hmm. it's it doesn't stand still. So I have kind of a, an art history question, which got which kind of sprang from what you were saying, Jennifer. And I wanted to ask: Do you feel any ties, or both of you, to your, to your work to kind of other explorations of of the city? We were looking today at some of Danny Lyons, the destruction of Lower Manhattan. Mm. But now that we're talking about shiny and, and new, I was thinking of like Charles Sheeler and some of these these works that were kind of celebrating this kind of construction. So do you feel any of those kind of documents are close to what you're doing or in the same tradition? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, well, which one? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> sort of all of them. Yeah. It's kind of taking from all of that and sort of squishing it together, yeah, yeah, hopefully, yeah. And, 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 and representing it in, in a... Because you have both. You have, you know, the, I mean, the angles that you create kind of lend itself to this kind of the, the glory of the buildings. The whole um, idea of it being everything... Even if even if it's like, and this I guess is what 
a collage element is, but but even if you can't see every building uh, in some of the things, like they're there, they're just underneath something else. Hmm. So like I did this piece in, in Virginia for Virginia Tech of Blacksburg, um, which is a tiny little town. It has a, a grid of 16 squares. And um, I every every building within there is on there. It's wow. just some of them are kind of like stacked yeah, on top layered. of the so, Yes, I was looking at that image. Yeah. So yeah. that was um, really important for once people were looking at it and they learned about that, they're like, wow, oh, wow, mm -hmm. you know. And, and the Newburg one, for example, that does that have every building in the downtown or in, uh, in On Newburgh? Liberty Liberty Street, which I think. Okay. Yeah, which is like the longest street in Newburgh uh -huh. and it has... Uh, That's, I, mean, I was looking history. at that image a lot, yeah. yeah. And how did you decide then that it should go on the side of a building? Was that part of it from the beginning? or That was from the beginning, okay. yeah. I, I was approached by um, this woman who's a curator up there um, who's been doing a lot of projects, and she was like, I have this side of a building. Um, <laughs> can you do something with it? Right. And so that was months and months of figuring out what that could be, how it could stay there but then come off again and um, how to get it up. Mm. Actually, yeah. how, how permanent was that? that particular piece. And the reason why I'm asking is that, first of all, to go outside, you're now printing on, is it safe to use some signage material, like yeah. a large printer with uh, billboard uh, media? Well, it, it, no? it, it ended up being the same printer I always use, which is a 24-inch Epson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, But the media is for outdoors, The correct? media was for out. Well, it was a little of both. So the uh -oh. thing that stuck to the bricks was for outdoors. And then on top of that was something else stuck on that. And then it was coated with an outdoor um, to, to save money. Uh, okay. The now, but yeah. that's what leads me to, to my next thing is that you're doing this uh, representation of what is now and things that are vanishing. Okay. Right. That exterior piece, if it's left there, will also go away in time. Right. Yeah. It's also very temporary unless you take it off and put it inside where it's safe. Right. Was that part of your intention also? Is that oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it was up for the summer and it actually came down that October. Oh, OK. So um, now, what happens with the, with most of your stuff that are site specific after the fact? Most of it, I can save it and uh -huh. use it again. OK. Um, yeah. Three or four times, and which is great. Does it sell? I mean, ones that are, that are in galleries that are a site specific corner piece, you'll take it down and it's available for sale in that sense to put someplace else. It, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it comes in pieces. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like an IKEA setup <laughs> where I have instructions. You got one of those little, those little L-shaped branches that comes with it. <laughs> um, well, not yeah. <laughs> We don't. I don't need that. But um, <laughs> but but yeah, there is there is an instruction sheet with like numbers one two three four five, and then it comes with like a sketch, and and I mean people who buy it can interpret it however they wish. Uh -huh. um, but you know that's the general idea. And then if a piece gets um, you know if it's on the floor and it gets messed up or something, they can uh, you know talk to the gallery and right. we can make a new one. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, but yeah yeah I I can save them. Um, do you do more than one uh, at times? At, uh, usually they there's just one, just and one. then yeah I mean if something gets sold I print it new. Okay. Of course. I see. I see. Packaged. So can you kind of walk us through a little bit like even starting with what camera you use when you're shooting and then. I assume that most of the organization and construction is done on the computer. Yeah. And then maybe you, later, you tell me. Yep, yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I still have a Canon Mark II. Okay, 5D um, Mark II. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I thought about buying something new, and it's just, it does what I need it to do. Uh -huh. Like, I, I, I rented a 5DS this summer, and it was beautiful and wonderful, but then the files are so big. Mm. Uh, because I'm smushing everything together, um, you know, the files just become gigantic, so... Um, it probably doesn't make a big difference in the final product when you have something so huge on a, right. You don't need all that detail with a wall size installation. It's like a billboard. Yeah. You can walk up to it. The dots are like the size of softballs. Right. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So I just have that. And then, um, I guess it's just the 24 to 105 lens mm -hmm. that we're going. I'm just usually on wide angle anyway. And, um, and yeah, I'll go, I walk around a neighborhood, uh, you know, it takes an hour or two. I see what I have. If I need to go back, I go back again. And then I have to sort through everything, cut out the buildings that are important. And then that starts the process of uh, how things go together. Because usually it has to do with this mapping, which I think you'd mentioned mm -hmm. in the questions. Mm -hmm. So so it, it is literally like I came out here and then I finished over over there. Though some of them now are more just like this is the biggest building, these are the smallest buildings. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of... But that's always part of the process. The actual physical location of the buildings in relationship to where they're placed in your piece. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, that's part of the walking experience. Yeah. I want it to be something that you can just, like, pop out of the subway and then you're looking up and you're like, oh, that was 
that was in that thing I saw. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, it isn't that I'm like in a helicopter or I'm on the top of some building or I have special access to something. This yeah. is all about like you're just walking down the street and and there's this hundred story building and it's there in front of you and um, I'm showing it to you mm-hmm. in in mm-hmm. you know the way that I am. So um so yeah and then they get cut out and they get turned into uh, some sort of composition. And to your question about cropping, it's interesting because it kind of goes with those compositions. I like rectangles. Mm-hmm. So it's usually something will be like be f- formed within a rectangle that has positive and negative space. Right. And so that's how it sort of becomes a, a shape. I mean, the shape is based on the walk as well. Um, but the, the, yeah. It's 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 cropped and framed in that way, and then that um, it depends on where it's going. Um, sometimes I make a model of the space, and then mm. I'll, I'll print a little tiny one out and kind of stick it in there. Mm. And you can stick your iPhone in there, and, and <laughs> it looks a lot like, like it's gonna what it's going like, to look right, like in right. real life. So do you do you let yourself play a little bit, or do you? I should say, are you very strict in the sense that okay, every building has to be in there, and it has to follow the pattern, or if for some visual reason it doesn't work, you're okay to just. You, it. I, I try to be pretty strict. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to take something out. I would feel bad about it. Yeah, because it's there. That's like I know the, it's there. It's gonna be. I'm gonna walk so. past it. I'm gonna be like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you didn't make it up the cut. Um, but I, I, I am. See if you, will be destroyed, if you right? were born in New York, you wouldn't care about that. <laughs> That's the difference. That's why we like people from, not from New York. Yeah, they do care. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there is, there are these rules, and then just from, um, you know, reading about how neighbors have changed or the evolution of things and like zoning laws, you can kind of pick out which things. Things are, are more or less important and focus on those. And is it kind of final once it's printed out of the computer in the sense that yeah, 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 yeah. you don't yeah. grab I d- some scissors at the end? and Yeah, no. no. Um, you'd mentioned usually you shoot with a wide angle. Do, do you change the focal length? Because obviously a wide angle is going to bend a building or mm. do some kind of distortion. A lot of keystone. Is stuff, that yeah. an issue or do you, do you like that? Or sometimes you'll, you won't, you'll use a, a different focal length because you don't want that or... Do you shoot them all the same? Well, this is the beauty of Photoshop. Uh-huh. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, it's like I'll shoot like 10 images of one building and then stick it into RAW and do the lens corrections mm-hmm. and then do mm-hmm. the photo merge and then do, you know, more lens corrections. And then so I'm I'm really kind of – and I didn't think I was doing that many manipulations, but I, I think I do. I think I really kind of shape it into my memory of mm-hmm. looking at it. Right. So, so, yeah, often things are keystoned because they're – they're giant, right. but but there's like a there's a limit to like what feels real yeah. mm-hmm. and what is just no. sometimes a corrected building looks fake. Yeah, because it, 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 it is fudged, and yeah. sometimes you to just back off a little bit and let a little bit of keystoning set in actually makes it easier in the eye, more believable. You just get past it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. happens. And Photoshop is the program you use. Yeah, pretty much everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And can you tell us what Phototex is? Yeah, Phototex is a um, – it's, it's basically like a, a repositionable wallpaper mm. inkjet media that is uh, made out of fabric. It has mm. – it's like a – has a weave to it. Oh, it does. Okay. So, yeah, um, yeah, which is one of the reasons it's reusable. Like you can just peel it off and it doesn't stretch mm. the oh, way some okay. of the other ones do. And, um, yeah, it's really resilient. Yeah. 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 And and the, let's say if you want to divide the process in three, you have the shooting, then you have the – you know, the work on the computer and the installation. How long could a shoot take? Could it just be one pass? Could, you know, one it walk could. down the street? Yeah. 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 If, if I'm paying attention. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, then, and then a lot of time on the <laughs> yeah. computer. And a lot of time on the computer. And, and then, install. and then, yeah, everything gets printed out and then cut out as individual pieces again. So, mm-hmm. so okay. then that's resizing, printing, right. tiling, cutting out. Mm-hmm. And then, J- Jason had mentioned that one of um, and sorry Tommy we're gonna the second half of the show is all yours buddy I, I was actually <laughs> hoping to ask Jennifer some questions yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to get in on this He's by asking questions taking copious yeah. notes let me uh, mention this because um, uh, Jason was saying oh this looks like some graffiti and obviously some of the work that you did earlier you know with the weed paste with graffiti, on graffiti yeah. is, right, that, yeah. is that conscious the, the kind of the shapes that you ultimately get with these buildings do have a sense of uh, a mm. feel like graffiti is that I, I don't know if it's like overtly conscious, but I definitely am clued into when I see things, especially when I see graffiti that goes over like windows or doors, mm-hmm. things that just sort of like block out the building itself or like the functionality of it. Like that's really interesting to me and how organic it can be. Um, so I, I do think there is a relationship, especially when things get placed outside. But yeah. Mm. 
I have one more question along the lines of creating what you do create. Um, have you learned after doing so many, I guess we'll call them tricks, to create a three-dimensionality or to create something that, you know, out of the, the layering and the, the, the shaping, is there any kind of, uh, I guess tricks is not the right word, but, you know, is there a kind of a method that you've seen that works better than others when it comes to creating that look? And can you talk about that a bit? Um, or is it just something that you eye and... Yeah, I again, and it's and really going. just something that that yeah. Yeah, I think it's once once you, it's funny because when you see it small, you can kind of like pick out parts and be like, okay, that needs to be a little darker and mm -hmm. that needs to be a little lighter, and then um, just treating it as as if it because it is sort of this composition in the computer, so treating it as a, a, a whole, you know, like if you were in the dark room, you can burn and dodge, and, right. you know. So so it is starting with that, and then. Um, and transferring that to each individual piece. And mm -hmm. when it's in the gallery, you can light it. Right. So that, I mean, outdoors you can't, but in the, that makes a huge difference. And that's a big part of it then yeah. too. You go back and, and yeah. use the lighting of the space. And mm -hmm. all. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I ask a quick question please? about your process? So yes. when, when you're composing, are you composing each cutout in one big Photoshop document? Yes. Interesting. So yeah. you put them all into something that's gigabytes large in the end? And are you I, having... Issues with large files because you're making yeah. huge things. Here. Yeah, I mean, I, I usually I'll I'll scale them down, and then um, I have like a mini version. Interesting. And so that yeah. doesn't make your computer slow down right, so exactly. much. Yeah, right. and then I can just go in and when I know how big I want it to be in the space, I can scale. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And cool. when does that decision come in? The the how big it will be in the space. Um. Later. Later. Yeah. 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 Can you talk about the ladders a little bit? Because uh, we were looking at those. and Well, I guess there's another question because they're, how in that the ladder shows that you've done, what is a real ladder in there? Anything? No. I didn't think so. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I looked like it was, but I just wasn't sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was actually curious about that myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, okay. no, nothing is real. Only when I'm hanging it, there, of course, is a ladder. <laughs> <laughs> and then that gets really funny because, it's a, yeah. But no, they're, they're, all, they're all flat. Um, it's total... Yeah. Two dimensional. Yeah. I and mean, especially when you rephotograph it, That's then they look real. Incredible. Um, but even yeah. when you walk into the space, some of them, you know, depending on the, the angle that they're on, they, they look sort of real. So. And how much time and experience did it take to kind of create that sense? I mean, is that something that you've been working on and trying to perfect? And, and at one point, like, well, it just doesn't look real. And then you went back and did it again. And Weirdly, it always looked real. Okay. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it, they started because, like, Whenever I started using photo text and I was doing things that weren't specifically city based, um, there was it was it was a project that had to do with objects within the gallery, and one of them was a ladder. Mm. And so the ladder got put into the piece, and the ladder was was partially on the floor, and it really just it just looked so real. Mm. And um, and then I did another piece, and another ladder got put in there for the same reasons. And and then it was just like, okay, wait, maybe this is just all about ladders, because I needed something that I could, I could do at short notice. Like I couldn't always spend months researching. And you know, someone's like, would you like to do a show here in a month? Right. Like, uh, okay. So so that's where those came from, and they just sort of got distilled. And you know, you're in galleries, you're in studios, you're in wherever. There, there's always a ladder somewhere. So it was like, I will start just gathering these right. and, and <laughs> make something out of it. So yeah, then it became about this idea of, of photography uh, lying, yeah. basically. Yeah. You could use it to to show you something that, that looks yeah. real, but then it's not real. And yeah. you know, do you still consider that collage? I mean, for the sake of this conversation, I guess it's more installation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. they don't usually go over top of each other. They're kind of like right. locked together. So right. it becomes more sculptural. Right. Yeah. Right. Cool. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, more with Jennifer Williams and Tommy Mintz. Stay tuned. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. Okay, we are back with a whole bunch of follow-up questions since our, we took our last break. You had just mentioned, Jen, that uh, we were talking about collage and you mentioned overlapping. 
Does a collage have to be overlapping images, or can you still identify collage as images that butt up together and not necessarily overlap? I never thought there would be a difference, but you just said something. I'm just wondering how you're defining it. I would define it as things that go on top of each other. That overlap. Yeah. So if they just butt up against each other, that doesn't qualify. No, I think that's just mounting. Oh. Um, <laughs> but then if you, like, paint on top of that, I, yeah, I don't know. Oh, okay. I, I feel like it's something that has to, to go on top of each other. Like, it has to be, like, pieces that are stacked. That, okay. Yeah. All right. That's have just you, me. Have you blended in non-photographic things into these works at all or in other works? I mean, I know you've done photos of cardboard and yeah. other things but when it comes to the final piece it's always photographic yeah hmm. yeah it is and how long I know there are different sizes and how would you say long is the process at least the process of creating it on the computer oh um depends on how crazy I'm being yeah I, I, I <laughs> you know it, it, at least like a week because I need to to put everything together kind of um, play with it for a while, step away, look at it, step away, and turn it around, mm -hmm. the, you know, um, yeah, I, it takes, yeah. It takes a while. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, Tommy, I got a couple of questions for you, <laughs> <laughs> more than a few. Well, we should, let's uh, like kind of interrupt by just clarifying a little bit that Tommy's okay. work is done on a, a system that he had a hand in creating, or at least the program yeah. anyway, and uh, they're digital randomly generated images to some degree. We want to actually get into the details, but... Uh, yeah, but there's one thing I wanted to hit on before that. Go for we're it. not going to lose down because that's a whole other topic altogether. You did a series of photographs where you had the uh, like a whole bunch of storefronts and then apartments on top of it. Mm, with the windows. The windows. The windows. Yeah. And I'm watching it. First of all, it, it's a great concept because the buildings, the, the outside of the exteriors are all daylight, obviously. And then you had a photograph at night to get the windows. Am I correct about oh, that? Those What's were all found story? images. Are they? So when Flickr first came out online, you know, there's this amazing you know, sort of dam bursting of people showing pictures of their lives. Mm -hmm. It was before you know, cell phones, right? And you know, self-obsession that we get bombarded with now. But um, I was really fascinated by looking at other people's lives. I'm kind of a you know, kind of a voyeur as a photographer and um, looking into windows as I walk down the street and would love to imagine what's going on inside so there. So none of those interiors belong in those exteriors? No, and those people oh, found pictures. Wow. I just okay. <laughs> did a Flickr search for my living room or my uh, apartment. That's a lot apartment. easier than knocking on doors and asking permission to figure somebody had to say, uh-uh, you ain't coming to my place. You well, <laughs> one of my favorite artists, Gal, Gal Albert Halliban, okay. does exactly that, right? Um I don't know what she calls her series of window views where she's looking across the city at windows and she has a, a flash set up in somebody else's apartment that she remote triggers. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. You know, she, she goes around leaving notes under people's doors asking if they'd like to participate and she puts a flash in there and she'll, you know, take pictures whenever she... Is, whenever she wants to. Yeah, whenever, whenever she wants she to. Want, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, so it's really <laughs> interesting. Interesting. That's true. Oh, I yeah. didn't know that work. Yeah. You know, I wanted to read this quote uh, that came as a description of Jennifer's work. Um, and uh, I thought it was actually might fit you a little bit where it says, like out of control software programs jumping back and forth between points of view, the dot, 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 the perspectives twist before our eyes. Mm -hmm. um, so talk us through a little bit your process. Sure. So Please. thank you. Yeah, so um, it, the window project is different. I went around just photographing a strip of buildings, you know, as I walked down the street, very much like a Druche or, you know, going down the mm -hmm. Santa Strip. Um, what I'm doing now currently is I stay in one place and, and take a sequence of images uh, and then run that sequence through a program I wrote. And the program detects areas of change. Anything that's moved, any light that's shifted gets read as a, a different pixel value. So your camera is, on a, is, is fixed, is on a, is on a tripod? So diff uh, yes, sometimes, most of the time I've been using um, uh, uh, what's called the Nodal Ninja, which is a tripod attachment that allows me to make a panoramic maintaining the nodal point yes, of my yes, camera yeah, to yeah. reduce parallax. Right. Um, and, and so, yeah, my camera is generally on that, although sometimes they handhold it and I get very different effects okay. of edges, which I enjoy at points, but it makes it much harder and longer to 
sort of align my pictures enough in Photoshop. That's that why I was asking if it was on a, a stable platform or not. So when it's on a stable platform, I could just run it straight through my right. software. If it's not, I then have a process where I um, start – well, actually, really now I have been shooting raw and um, running everything through Lightroom, processing it, and then running it through my software or – in the interim, in Photoshop, I'll do um, a layer alignment where I change the blending mode of a top layer and and move it and rotate it very slightly so that it uh, aligns as well as it can. Uh, and and there are always differences, of mm-hmm. course, and that's mm-hmm. what um, makes the collage in 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 the software program the the, the change. Um, so yeah, there's there's the the. The shooting, which I, I sort of would prefer to spend much more time doing, and and this process was something I imagined I'd do on the street using computers outdoors because mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. I love working on computer, but I really don't like sitting inside. Um, so I started this project. I, I was I thought of it years and years ago as a um, graduate school project to install in a bus shelter when I was waiting for the bus in Jamaica, Queens. Mm-hmm. Um, to have a, a little camera um, installed in, instead of the advertisement, have a screen, which we now have, unfortunately, everywhere, and um, have pictures of the people in the bus shelter appear on the screen and they could interact with themselves in this growing collage of themselves over time waiting for the bus. Mm. Um, <laughs> And and I idea. well thanks and and I went around. <laughs> I, 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 I thought my programmer friends would think it was a good idea, but right. nobody had the time to work with me uh-huh. on this. This is two thousand five, I guess, and then two thousand thirteen. The Raspberry Pi computer was released, which is a very um, welcoming platform for develop first time developers. There, there's uh, sort of everything's baked in if you want to work with Python, it's there. If you want to work with C, it's there. If you want to just do drag and drop programming with Scratch, it's there on the, in the operating system. And um, so I started with that. I, I connected the Raspberry Pi computer to a webcam and, and um, actually had a show kind of based on that very low resolution camera that I was using then. It was like 640 by 480 pixels. And it made collages and made them quickly. Um, and, and it was really fun, but it wasn't something that I br- got a lot of information um, sort of to describe the world outside. And as I started using higher resolution cameras, the Raspberry Pi computer started being too slow. So I had to use a more powerful computer. And of course, now I'm spending a lot of time indoors just processing <laughs> these images with the same program that was written in Python for the Raspberry Pi now sort of iterated to run on a MacBook, you know. And how many... Photos will you take at a, or how many in a setting or in a, of a scene? About 36. Okay. Got a roll. Okay. All right. Interesting. And Interesting. the format camera? So I started with the webcam and then I was using a Raspberry Pi um, 5 megapixel and then they had an 8 megapixel camera that was uh, attached via a ribbon cable to the computer itself. And then I started shooting with my Canon 5D Mark One. Right, mm. and which I have in my bag <laughs> still. Um, and now I've been, and then I started renting different cameras. I tried the Sony A7R3, which was beautiful, and the Canon 5DS I rented also, which was beautiful. And then I tried the Sigma um, DP2 Quattro, mm-hmm. which is kind of a, a funny camera, and I really enjoy it. So I got one of those, and I've been using that recently. So we, we joke about Sigma shooters, but, yeah, I mean, I'm really You're enjoying it. You're not alone it. there. There are other so. people that really are into that camera. Yeah. But the reason I asked you that is because you actually said take about 36 pictures, a roll. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a, it's a <laughs> sort of... I know, you know I know, but yeah. it's, it's, it, the com- I caught that The sense of one. completion you know, <laughs> that we, we go back to. And is, d- is it still where the computer is, atta- is connected, or you, now that operation is separate? So I went through a number of iterations of... One of the problems with having a computer connected on, in the field is you're always futzing with the computer, you're sort of paying attention to the computer, and also things run out of batteries very quickly. Screens take up a lot of power. Oh, yeah. And so I was first... Um, I was using an HDMI screen that had a, a Nikon battery that would power it, um, Marshall screen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And um, so that was cool. I connected that to my Raspberry Pi and had a keyboard that I um, would then control the computer with, um, connected via Bluetooth outdoors. Um, and then I 
on one iteration when the Raspberry Pi got fast enough and actually had Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built in, I then um, used uh, remote desktop software and an iPad mini that I carried around with me and would control my computer via the iPad mini screen. Hmm. Um, there are all sorts of headaches, you know, with Wi-Fi connections and things going up, kind of working when you want them to at that mm-hmm. right moment. And so at this point, I've reduced and reduced, and I'm just sitting there with a cable release, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> taking pictures, looking at what's going on around me, okay. and and being in that moment, and then I know what I'm going to process. It helped in the beginning to have the process happening to understand what what's going to appear, what's going to be left out, you know, wh- where are these interesting moments going to occur. And was any of that, could you predict any of that? Could you control any of that? Or was that just something that the program did for you? It's something that I don't control. I mean, I wrote the program right. and I can change the code to right. change but how image it's going to... image though, no. No, yeah, yeah I'm yeah, not yeah. changing the yeah. code image per image. And, yeah. and I can anticipate it a little bit at this point, but it yeah. continues to surprise me. And I love that surprise. I find new things later in the picture mm-hmm. process, in the image-making process. Right. That and it, your settings when you're shooting are all the same? It's always the, the exposure time and the f-stops are all for each shot within that 36, let's say? Or so do you... I do vary them, and uh-huh. one of the, not a, to plug Lightroom here, but uh-huh. um, the um, there's a setting that is uh, uh, control Shift M. Um, it's it's <laughs> balance. <that> one, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, when you sync the all photos uh, for the exposure, overall exposure. It does some algorithmic understanding voodoo. of yeah, yeah, yeah. Adobe uh, Voodoo. Adobe yes. Voodoo, and it, and it works quite well and allows me to change my settings. But generally, I do shoot ISO 100, mm-hmm. uh, raw. Mm-hmm. Uh, one one twenty fifth of a second and whatever yeah. aperture. Yeah. Yeah, you know. yeah. And you take a street photographer's kind of attitude toward what you're looking at and trying to get, you know, whatever's going on on the edges of the frame and, and get how do you how do you approach it in, in that sense? I mean, I think of myself as somewhat of a street photographer, but also somewhat of a landscape photographer. I mean, I'm looking at the space around and, and, and the buildings and what's going on with the light striking the buildings as well as the people moving through the space. So, um, yeah, I, I, I do like to have people coming in the edge of the frame, mm-hmm. um, like a street photo, you know, or mm-hmm. sort of mm-hmm. juxtapositions of people sort of passing each other and doing different things in, in the moment there. Um, so, yeah, I, I do approach mm-hmm. it as a street photographer. I, yeah. I think a lot of, I, you know, I, I feel like there's a long history of street photography that I, I like to think is continuing, mm-hmm. not just in, in the direct street photography going out sure. and, you know, sort of standing of course, there yes. taking yeah, pictures, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. sort of documenting things in, in ways that new technology allows for. And I, I'm really fascinated by all the cameras that are just out there yeah. taking pictures all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the new uh, Wi-Fi kiosks running up and down the avenues in Manhattan now all have cameras that are taking pictures, actually. And, you know, I'd love to... Get to, access to them. Yeah, get access to those <laughs> and yeah. use them for street photography, right? That's totally, totally. Wonderful <laughs> moments occur. So other than, you know, the, the decisions you're making on the street, where do you feel that you're having the most influence on, on the final product? Like, other than you wrote the program, of course, you're snapping the images... And then the program does its thing, and then where do you come in after that? Like, what what's the next steps? So and I sit there running the program at this point, mm-hmm. and and one of the things that I struggle with is to keep my. I mean, it's kind of boring. Mm-hmm. I don't like sitting in front of the computer mm-hmm. doing repetitive tasks. So mm-hmm. I, I've been doing some things to amuse myself in the process, <laughs> um, and and as I sort of choose which picture the sequence of the images to run through the um, software or position the images. So you, you, it, you'll, re, you'll re-sequence what you've shot to put, as you put it in? Okay. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, are, there, also, um, are there sliders involved like for opacity because the images blend to come and go? So it's fixed. So um, the, the software, and, and one of the things that's really boring is I'm um, doing this all through terminal in the Mac OS, you have the ability to just type in commands and run right. those commands. And uh, so I'm doing it through that and then seeing the result. Um, and in order to amuse myself, recently I've been trying to live stream like my studio practice over Twitch 
which or or YouTube Live, which okay. are these gamer mm-hmm. platforms. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I'm trying to like gamify it a little oh, bit. Oh, interesting. You know, where I'm so like playing, like, hey, how can I have fun at the computer? Which and is are kind you of getting some feedback you know? as you're doing that, or is there anyone else involved? I, I haven't had no. many viewers. No, <laughs> no but some guy with that? a tank attacked him, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, but people, let's let's find him and follow him. All right, <laughs> let's mess with this process. All right, <laughs> cool. But anyway, continue. So, well, quick question, like. At least when you're when you were initially doing this, how long was the time for the the program to do its thing? When after the the thirty six, let's say, were shot, right? Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why I switched to a more powerful computer. As I yeah. increased the resolution, the the, the process, rendering time probably went through the roof. Through right? the roof. So yeah. it used to be half a second, and then a second, and then a minute. Mm-hmm. And once I got to that minute and process per frame, I said I can't sit here and wait for it to do its thing anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was on the Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. So now I'm running a much faster processor in my MacBook. And it... um it's, it's quite quick. Maybe it's 15 seconds per frame, 10 seconds per frame, depending on the resolution. It, it is different depending on the camera mm-hmm. um, still. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and to answer your question, I do run the images through the software and then I go back into Photoshop. And if I'm doing a panoramic, I'll put those frames together, place them next to each other in Photoshop, either overlapping or placing them next to one another, changing the angle. Sometimes they're stretching, skewing, mm-hmm. and doing that kind of thing once again. Mm-hmm after the program has done its thing. And I choose my favorite iteration. It gives me an iteration per shot, and I might like one, you know, sort of in the middle, and then it gets right. worse. Right. So oh, sometimes okay. that it peaks in, in uh-huh. my view. And do they change drastically, or is it just kind of a, a minor changes in, in reduction? Not reductions, but... Yeah, it's an addition or a reduction. Or yeah, maybe something I enjoyed disappeared right. that I was, you know, right. sort of... Yeah, yeah. Seeing there, and then uh, yeah. uh, oh, that's the fun the part. That. That, that seems to be the that thrill, is the fun right? part. Yeah, yeah. 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 When yeah. You get to yeah. that. Yeah, interesting, cool. Um, and now you're going to be printing. That's the what is it going to be? The, I know you have a show coming up, and we can talk about it at the end. But the ultimate uh, format for these will be what now? Yeah, so I've been printing um, on metal. There's the dye sublimation direct onto uh-huh. metal process, okay. which are really cool. I mean, um, really beautiful result that um, has an the metal as the sort of paper color, where you don't sort of coat the metal, but instead you have... That's your base. Your yeah, base the, white is now base Silver. Metal. Yeah, yeah. Silver, and, yeah. And I feel like that has a really interesting digital feel, mm-hmm. which sort of echoes the digital process and the digital sense that I, I, you know, I'm bringing into this as an artist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, did you coin the phrase, the ADPC or automated? No, sorry. Goodness. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Did Aut- you? Automated no? digital photo cloud. It's something like how do you describe a process? Uh-huh. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it is. it was always collage for you. It was always part of it. It's collage, montage. I mean, I, I, I was interested in this conversation yeah, you're yeah, having about, yeah. like, does it What's have to overlap or not? And mm-hmm. I agree. I think if if it's next to one another, maybe if I'm thinking of Ray Metzger's work, you know, mm-hmm. where he has two pictures juxtaposed. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and I don't consider those collages. He does collage where he'll overlap, you know, many pictures, when I, you know. But the, 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 the pictures that are butting up once, you know, one, against one another are either diptychs or triptychs mm-hmm. or something okay. yeah. different. Yeah. Points taken. So, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. It was interesting. Okay, we, and it, this was hinted at a little bit earlier, but within the different genres of photography um, and the history of at least New York photography, uh, there's always a little bit of ur- urban activism. Do you guys feel that that's part of your work, commenting on gentrification and and the changes that we see in the city? And and obviously, there's good, but also what we're losing is that kind of you editorializing. Important? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, is, is there an activism, I guess? Maybe not. that's a strong word, but, you know, right, yeah. comment on this. I mean, I feel like it, it, it's there if you want to see it, but mm. I'm not seeing it in, in such a uh, loud way, mm. I suppose, um, because part of me is like, uh, like I say, I'm like documenting a thing that is happening. So it's already it's already happening. Mm. And you're coming from, if I'm not mistaken, from farmlands. Is that true? I mean, the, or Pre- kind of pretty much. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I I grew up far enough outside of Pittsburgh that it, it was sort of right on the edge. I mean, I worked on a farm in high school picking uh-huh. strawberries. Okay. Um, right. But it was a, a maybe thirty minute drive into Pittsburgh, okay. which in the eighties was not a great place to be. You know, right. it was falling apart. Right. So, uh, you know, there's been a huge transformation there. Not at the scale that's happened here, but mm-hmm. but that whole sense of of change, 
I think, you know, growing up somewhere that was sort of dying and then, um, you know, moving here and kind of watching this place. Mm -hmm. um, Reinvent itself yeah, again. Constantly, I mean, constantly it, reinventing yeah, it's itself. Constantly re yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Tommy, coming from uh, the land of Jane Jacobs and yeah. the village and this area, I know it's always something that you're keenly aware of, but do you, how do you feel about your work in that relation? Yeah, absolutely. I do think of Jane Jacobs as one of these formative sort of thinkers in, in my understanding of the city mm -hmm. and and this ideal of a vibrant city and her sort of sense of what makes a vibrant city and the characters and the blocks are, are what attract me as a photographer and I do think I'm looking for those places and maybe looking for the loss of those places in some of my photographs mm -hmm. too you know uh, 33rd and 10th I was photographing over and I sort of what's yeah. going on it's yeah. really amazing when you have yeah. these spaces that have just been wiped clean yeah, i just recently years, found yeah. some yeah. transparencies i'm in the midst of converting a bunch of stuff from analog to digital and like little storefronts and buildings and facades from the west side highway and all around over here that gone and gone. it's not that long ago not at all like, i don't yeah. know yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a, one of yeah. those powers of photography i think to help us understand the change that we mm -hmm. forget normally and that forgetting i think is something i'm very interested in that sense of, oh, that was there, what's what's there now? I can't remember. Right. And that dissolving of memory um, is something that I, I try to touch on mm -hmm. in my work. So, yeah, I, I do think it's very um, activist in that way, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. telling people. I know some pictures I find be tremendously powerful looking back on New York City pictures, uh, photographs taken in the late 60s, early 70s, when before Battery Park City was built, Essentially, it was all the sand and stone that they dug out to build the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. And they built, it was like, I don't know how many acres of new mm -hmm. land, but it was just laying there on the southern tip of Manhattan. People were just hanging out. There was like a giant beach. And New York City was behind it. Now it's just all monstrous buildings. That's all history. Yeah. And it was a short sliver of time that that existed. Mm -hmm. And you look at those pictures and boom, there it is. Mm -hmm. It's great. Yeah, yeah, that's why I was thinking of that, those Danny Lyon photos too and yeah. that destruction, which is, you could... That's echoed now. That was that's fifty years ago. That's like mm -hmm. the late sixties. That series, and the same thing's happening now in another part mm. of the city. You yeah, know, and we just witnessed witnessed it right here in this neighborhood right, in the past right. three or four years. Yeah, yeah. Another series that caught my attention is WNYC had this series on the Jazz Loft, eight twenty one mm -hmm. Sixth oh, Avenue. Oh, I saw you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's this old building right yeah. in the middle of these giant hotels mm -hmm. that are shooting up along Sixth Avenue and Upper Twenties. And and yeah, it's, it's these moments where you just see what's left. Mm -hmm. These little moments, mm -hmm. that are little left, nuggets. Whole, yeah. Yeah. Whole. Now, do you think the process that you're doing and would work? I've seen a few of your photos of flowers and, and landscapes outside of the city, but do you feel it's kind of uh, part and parcel of the cityscape? So the images that are of botanical specimens grew out of my photographs actually of 28th Street between 6th and 7th Avenue is this flower district. The flower district, yeah, yeah it's a and great place. It, it is, it's magical. And I realized that I was enjoying taking pictures of flowers. And... and um, when you take a sequence of pictures of a flower in 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 the breeze, actually, and then run it through this collage this mm -hmm. collaging algorithm that I use, it creates a very interesting composition of shapes. And um, yeah, I, I don't know if that is urban in a sense, mm -hmm. but it does have that same energy of motion, uh, time portrayed in a flat image, mm -hmm. and it's a time lapse in a sense True. that. Yeah. The other pictures are also. Yeah, that's an interesting point that we didn't talk about the, the time element in, in this. Uh, you know, and uh, yeah, that's all. <laughs> I mean, he has to say, <laughs> but thanks for bringing it up. Oh, sure. <laughs> no, also, I mean, you just mentioned. I mean, we're talking about change in cities. And it's like w w cities and urban environments are not only just giant buildings. Sometimes they're tiny little things along the sidewalk. Absolutely. That we just pass by zillions of times and never even notice. It's, it's scale and perspective. So that's another big factor in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, Jennifer, uh, first of all, two things. Any projects coming up? Any installations? Any shows? And where can people find your work? So right now there's one thing up at the Children's Museum of Manhattan. Oh, nice. Cool. Um, there's yeah. a show called Art Artists and You mm -hmm. that um, they actually have four artists there doing residencies, um, I think for three-month slots. And through the program there's um, there's – other works that are up for the duration of the show. I don't know how much longer it's going to be up for, but it's, been, it's already been up for like six months. Mm -hmm. And um, they have a ton of like big 
in, uh, installation-y kind of things that have to do with the, the programming of the artists that are there. So, um, so that's there mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. And the piece that's there is part of this New York City of Tomorrow project that I started at the Queens Museum. Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that I'm hoping to, I'm waiting to hear back about stuff from some grants to um, continue by doing a project that talks about Hudson Yards and Flushing Queens. Mm because they're like both the, seven, the yeah. ends of the yeah. seven. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it would be outdoors and it's going to be in Flushing. Okay. So it'll kind of take Manhattan out. Don't you have a few works that are permanently displayed? Um, there's no? one that's up at the Foundation visit? Center okay. um, downtown, you? but yeah, it's not in the in the public area. Oh, okay. But I think you can kind of call them up and be like, hey, can, can you see Jen's thing? <laughs> yeah. Just um, say Jennifer sent you yeah. and uh, you get right totally. through. Yeah. Totally. Okay. With lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... Any future projects that are going in any different directions at the time being? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Do tell. Yeah, I, I started this project this summer photographing uh, these tools that my grandfather either mm. used or made. Wonderful. Um, coming from a place, you know, this very sort of rural place in Pennsylvania. Um, so so I'm photographing them with a 4 by 5 with a digital back. It's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. And they're turning into palladium prints. Cool. Ooh. Nice. Yeah. So, that should be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was a whole kind of, I'm still conceptualizing how to, to sort of talk about it, but mm -hmm. um, it's kind of going back to my roots and, and seeing where my aesthetic comes from. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, these things that he made weren't meant to be beautiful, but, but they are. Right. And they're just made out of parts that were lying around because he didn't have money to buy things. and that's like great. To build, yeah. Are you so. going to be doing your own Palladium printing? Or are you going to? Yeah. That's great. So yeah. that's going to be a whole other direction for you. Then. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. wonderful. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. And also, what about uh, websites or anything like that? Uh, um, people I, want to see more of your work. I do have one, yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's jennifer-williams.com. Right. There's a lot of Jennifer Williamses that are artists out right. there. So right. if you don't put the dash in, you'll get all kinds of things. <laughs> uh, and Instagram also or not so much? Um, not, not so much. It's okay. mostly food photos on Instagram. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. We'll take a look. Okay. Okay. Tommy, uh, <laughs> anything coming up? Any new shows, installations, and where can people find your work? So I do have a show coming up in late April, May at the Hudson Guild Gallery on 26th Street. Um, and actually... Uh, in their lobby space, I do have a print on public display. So oh, okay. 26th between 9th and 10th, the uh, mm -hmm. Hudson Guild mm -hmm. Community Center. And a lot of your work is, of this series anyway, is shot in, in the neighborhood in Chelsea, right? Yes. Yeah, so that's and fitting. Flower District. Right. right. Greenwich Village. Right. Yeah, cool. All right, and, and, and just continuing working on this. I mean, this has been a long-term project uh, taking many different forms right yeah it's and, evolved it's taken yeah. longer than i ever expected it to mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's kept my attention right. longer than i ever imagined it would yeah. um and i do have a show coming up uh, scheduled in um in in hungary in budapest hungary in, wow. in august i'm not sure what the political situation there is right oh, now yeah. and i was talking about making street photography and the laws are very different there yeah and so it's interesting to sort of navigate other places as a artist, you know, whose work might be interpreted very differently there. Oh yeah. So I'm I'm planning on doing a rear projection there of collages that were previously generated in a gallery window with on on prints actually on tra large transparent prints and have a projection that way. I don't know. Yeah. So the, it's interesting to sort of see how it's the it's, different forms right, it can take. How it, how it can take and how I might move away from it yeah. soon. I don't know. You know, yeah. it's been see it's where been it goes. Yeah. Well, I mean, having seen you know pieces of it over the past several years, it seems like it's at a great place now. It seems like it's coalescing really well. I don't know. Thank you. And I do I've feel like anyway. the higher resolution cameras have kept me very interested. There, mm -hmm. there are these little details on the sidewalk or whatever that are now showing up in the pictures that make for a much richer viewing experience and understanding of you know the effect and if you so. if the prints that you expect to make how what kind of size are we talking um so i'm making metal prints right now i actually received a a, a grant to make experiments and i'm experimenting on metal prints from different print suppliers i, I tried to make them myself on mm. an epson 7600 are you printing on the 7600 still or do you 78 78 but it's yeah. similar yeah um and and wasn't happy with the results of inkjet on metal. Though yeah. there are really interesting products now that you can buy and run through your printer. Yeah. Um, the dye sublimation 
printing mm-hmm. facilities are, are varied and widespread. And I'm just trying to figure out who I want to work with mm-hmm. at this point. So I'm going down the list right. and online of different print suppliers. So I've been getting comparison prints that are um, 20 by 24, or 24 by 30 from each place okay. and seeing how they look. Um, right. So that's the size. And I'm also planning on printing very large. There are these banner Mm-hmm. printing um, mm-hmm. uh, facilities that are very inexpensive, mm-hmm. actually, for large prints. I'm yeah. going to be experimenting with that. I do want to print some of these high-resolution collages very large so you can see you know, the detail, which you really can't otherwise. Cool. Okay. Well, and websites? Oh, I have a website. That's my name, Tommy Mintz. M-I-N-T-Z. 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 Yeah. And yeah. I am on Instagram at Tommy Mintz NYC. I have Tommy Mintz. But I forgot my password, so I started Tommy Mintz NYC. <laughs> mm-hmm. Another one, but, me too. Right, and then Yahoo. I don't know. Anyways, um, and yeah, I think I think that's where I, I often I, I often post things to Instagram first. Although I've been doing a lot of panoramics, and have found that it doesn't translate well to no. the Instagram experience. No. So my website actually has more. And also, work. you've yeah. done made some gifts out of these automated. Digital collages. Yes. And those are pretty cool. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And that's actually what I'm thinking about rear projecting in, mm-hmm. in Budapest. Mm-hmm. I can see that. I can see that. that. Great. And for folks, take a look at the B&H Explorer website. We'll have a few examples of their work up to get a sense of it and definitely check out their sites and Robert Mann Gallery, Hudson Guild for shows. Yep. Imagery out of the box. No toys about. Out of the square and rectangle as well, I might add, in most cases. Okay. If you are not a subscriber to the B&H Photography Podcast, what you waiting for? It is free. It is informative. And from what we hear, it's entertaining. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify. And you can always find us online at the B&H Explorer website. And coming soon, our new Facebook page. Stay tuned for details. For now, on behalf of Jason, John, and myself, thank you so much for tuning in today. <laughs>